trying to find out. Um, but uh, why I have it be better for the user? Because um, it's actually her fault that you're here. But she was the one sending me the code for the 3D project, and then I applied together with the consortium without her. <laughs> <laughs> so for that, so um, yeah, uh, I think it's a bit yeah, you should feel bad now. <laughs> and um, you, uh, you will be happy by lots of opportunities. I know that one of the students already contacted her to ask her, you know, to come to Münster University, and you can do the same. Uh, and uh, yeah, if there is uh, room against that, yeah, I can host you there as well. And it's the same for the others, so ask uh, you know, about the options. So there are plenty of them through Erasmus and different kinds of uh, changes. So, uh, Claudia, thank you so much uh, for coming. The floor is yours, and uh, I encourage all the others to ask questions, and uh, we'll be continuing them after uh, it. Yeah. Yeah. I, f I feel a bit naked without a computer in front of me, so, okay, so yeah. Good. So, uh, thank you for inviting me, Uroš. It's a pleasure to be here, so I really enjoy it. And it's a as I said, it's a really strange situation to have no computer, but uh, it should work. So, um, my idea was uh, to give you today an introduction in how we assess cognitive motor performance and why we use VR scenarios to do that. I plan to show you some results on our studies we did during the last, let's say, six years on this topic. And in between, we'll have a presentation of Robert. Robert recorded um, a video together with Julian um, on how um, our VR setup works and, and how we use it. So I'll implement it in the middle of my presentation. I'll start with a short overview about why is cognitive motor performance important, what's about VR. I'll show you some of our car driving results first because last year Robert gave an introduction into FNIRS using this car driving setup. And this year he'll give an introduction about this Grail setup, uh, so walking while assessing dual tasking performance. Okay, that's the plan for today. Uh, we heard a lot about motor cognitive interaction. We heard by Urosh this morning that's important um, to assess what's going on when you are, for example, standing and thinking about m many different things. And we have these cognitive motor interactions a lot during everyday life. So most tasks uh, require the simultaneous performance of a motor and a cognitive task, be it walking, be it driving, be it um, yeah, just standing here and talking. So typically you have a motor task to control, for example, to control your gait or to control your driving performance. And at the same time, you have a cognitive task like avoid collisions with other pedestrians. That cannot happen to me right now, but uh, <laughs> Um, at least reading, for example, what, what I uh, prepared for the presentation here. Or a cognitive task might be to follow traffic rules or traffic light signs. Or what's very typical right now is to, you, talk, uh, you type in your cell phone while you are walking or you talk to another person. So that are all dual casting scenarios that happens to us in real life. And what we also know is that it's easy for most of us and it's easy if you are used to it, but it's getting more difficult if you get older and also for children it's more difficult. And the idea is that older adults have to invest more of their resources, more of their cognitive resources, more of their motor resources, when they have to walk and talk at the same time, for example. And the, uh, the study of Uros this morning, I think it's a nice example that if you train your cognitive system, you have more resources available to perform also motor tasks. So this is a um, motor cognitive interaction. And now let's have a look at VR scenarios. So we questioned ourselves about six years ago, so what's the difference between lip, typical lab task and real life scenarios? So being in a lab during 
computerized tests, doing motor tests in the lab differs a lot from real life. So, for example, with respect to the stimuli, we can say in the lab we typically have a limited number of stimuli. When we are outside, we have a very complex environment with an infinitive number of stimuli. We have a repetitive task typically in the lab and we have an ever-changing task in the real life condition. Stimuli are very well defined when we conduct a study in the lab, when we carefully prepare it and when we are outside the real world it's difficult. So Klaus and Anna talked a lot about it and Anna is <coughs> nodding so she, she did a lot of research about that. So. Same with the uh, responses. So also here we have uh, differences. So a limited number of responses in the lab, infinite numbers outside, rep repetitive respons responses inside, and so on and so on. Same with uh, uh, the complexity. So responses in the lab are typically less complex than outside. Last but not least, uh, the task purpose. So if you are outside, there is a certain need to perform a task. You know what you are doing, you know why you are doing it. When you are in the lab, it's sometimes a bit strange what the, what the experimenter asks you to do. And uh, the same is with the familiarity of the task. So uh, typically you are used to a task outside, but not so much inside the lab. So that's, that's a general differentiation between lab tasks and real life tasks, we would say. And I just brought you one example. It's a, it's a study conducted about 10 years ago now where they just compared cognitive performance outside the lab and workplace performance, uh, sorry, cognitive performance inside the lab uh, and workplace performance of older worker. And you see here also participants performed worse in the cognitive task. They performed very well at the workplace. So just one example that cognitive performance in the lab not necessarily predict also cognitive performance in real life and outside the lab. And that's the reason why we thought, okay, so one idea to um, investigate cognitive motor performance inside the lab would be to use VR because it's maybe a more realistic environment, more an ecological valid environment, and here we have a complex um, yeah, responses avail uh, possible and we have a more pre um, yeah, familiar um, and present task pr um, purposes. So VR might be a solution, walking outside would be even better, but we started with a VR setup uh, um, here and did a couple of experiments on this by looking at car driving and pedestrian, sorry, I should use this, by looking at car driving, I don't see the mouse, there, by looking at car driving and pedestrian walking. And for car driving, our VR scenario was a, car, um, a driving simulator for walking. It was first um, um, non-motorized treadmill and later the grail system. I'll introduce to, introduce it to you in a couple of minutes. So let's start with the car driving. Uh, for the car driving, our characteristics were that participants were asked to follow a lead car, to keep distance from the lead car uh, relatively constant, to react to the lead car brake manos, uh, to execute execute a realistic task and a distracting task and uh, to perform this task as single and as du a dual task. So participants were asked to sit in the driving simulator and they just drove or they drove um, while performing additional cognitive tasks. And we tried to design these cognitive tasks as realistic as possible. Um, so this, is, this was our idea, so this is how um, very abstract our driving scenario looks like. And um, during this driving task, particip participants had to do three different cognitive tasks. We call, it, call them also distraction tasks. And that was uh, one um, first driving, uh, um, sorry, 
typing a three digit number, like for example, three, four, five, um, the other task was memorizing gas station prices or traffic news. And the third task was stating arguments for or against a certain issue. Like for example, why e so what, what speaks against or for e-mobility. And all uh, stimuli were presented auditorily or visually. So in the, for example, in the visual stimulation, so if the, we uh, presented the stimuli visually, we used this memorizing of gas, uh, gas station prices and the traffic news that was our auditory stimuli. So this was the driving setup and um, the task popped up in a random order and uh, participants, as I said, they drove just uh, on the driving simulator, they drove um, in addition, so they did it in addition with the, this cognitive distracting task and they drove by autopilot and just were asked to perform this cognitive task. At the same time, we used an FNIRS system to assess um, brain activity over the prefrontal cortex in this study. And the near setup, we used here and how it worked, that was introduced by Robert last time. So I just show you the results. Here are the behavioral results. And as I said, we had different types. So we had the argument arc, it's a stating argument type, it's a three di digit number typing, VM, uh, WM is a working memory task. So this is the memorizing gas station prices or traffic use. News, we have the auditory and the visual uh, stimuli here. And we have results for the young adults and for the old ones. And what you see here is that um, we have higher performance decrements for the older ones, um, particularly for speed and steering control, as you see uh, on the upper row of the slides. Um, and we also have task specific effects. So we have particularly effects for typing. And here effects are even higher when the um, tasks were presented auditorily than visually. And um, also tasks uh, or effects differ um, with respect to the outcome measures. So here we looked at velocity, we looked at steering control, and we looked at following distance. Here we always looked at the variability of these parameters and depending on what par parameters we focus, we found different results. As I said, uh, we also found differences between auditory and visually presented stimuli. So uh, I think what you can take with you, it really depends on what stimuli and what tasks participants are asked to do in addition to driving. And it also depends how you design your study, at what parameters you look, and also how you um, so whether you use uh, visual or auditory stimuli and also the responses might influence your results. So then we looked at the brain and the brain activation by use of this FNIR setup. So you learned uh, about the EEG setup before and on the upper right panel you see how we place the optodes for the NIRS. And what we can see here is Yes, we found age differences in the brain activation. So we have differences in brain activation for young and older one, old ones. Interestingly, they not all point to the, uh, to the same direction. So for the young adults, we found higher brain activation when they were asked to state arguments. And for the old ones, we found higher brain activation when they were asked to type the three digit number. We also found a small to moderate correlation between brain and behavior. So uh, showing that um, this somehow reflects what we also see in our behavioral data here. So that were our FNIRS uh, results. So the, that were the first results we got with, with our FNIRS system. We were very happy to 
see that it works and that work that it really works in this setup and that we can see these differences between old and young ones and between the different tasks. And later I'll show you some uh, FNIRS results we, um, we collected while walking. So, but first of all, I brought another bra uh, car driving study because I think it's also interesting. It has nothing to do with, with FNIRS here. We just looked at the behavioral data, but that's also um, a study related to yeah, somehow real life. So here in this uh, analysis, we ask ourselves, so what's about distraction and braking? So can distraction, so when you are asked to perform a typing task or an argumenting task or a memory task, can this per, uh, yeah, cause persisting effects that we can see in the braking performance collected several seconds after distraction? And there was, um, we scanned first of all the literature and found that most studies that looked at driving and braking behavior so far, they looked at um, effects up to 400 milliseconds after distraction. So 400 milliseconds after distraction is, seems to be a long time, but it's maybe compared with real life, not so long. And we thought, so maybe we find distraction effects that are even longer, but that haven't measured at all before. So, and that's the reason why we looked at our braking performance after distraction. And here again, you see the, um, you see the gas, stage pri uh, gas stage price task. And you see this uh, typing task, and we looked at breaking reaction after that. And sorry, that was too quick. And we looked at breaking reaction or breaking responses within five to 25 seconds after this distraction task. And here are our results. So when we look at the um, two different parameters here, brake pedal on or a gas, gas pedal off, we see that the preceding cognitive task leads to slower um, reactions or slower responses for both variables. And um, what's interesting here is not that this leads to slower reactions, so that's what we all expected to see. But what's interesting is that we really see, see these um, reduced reaction times also after a longer time. So here we split the reaction times with respect to this ZOA, so saying um, uh, below 10 seconds after distraction, within 10 to 12 sec seconds after reaction, distraction, and above 12 sec seconds after distraction. And what we see here, um, now I have to switch the mouse, or the mouse now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's, I see a mouse, but not where I want, I, it's not moving where I want it to move. So it doesn't matter. So you see on the right hand side, you see uh, a... Ah. <laughs> Sorry, can I? Yeah? It's okay. okay. Yeah? No? Okay, Sorry. it doesn't matter. So we'll, we'll manage it. So on the right hand side of this uh, figure, you see um, the, uh, the reaction times with, uh, with the low, mat, and high um, SOA and see that, of course, directly after distracting, the reaction time is highest, but it holds for a while. So, so even um, after a certain time, so a t 12 to up to 25 seconds, we found, um, I shouldn't put my hand here, we found um, <laughs> reductions of reaction time here. So, we see this persisting effects in um, driving behavior, and uh, I think that's interesting because it hasn't been looked at before. So, in the lab, we always focus on very, very short di uh, distances after, after distraction and not at these long time intervals, but they might have really an effect 
for daily life and performance in ecological, ecological valid scenarios. Okay, so that was the driving. And now I switch to street crossing because as I said before, the second paradigm we looked at was street crossing. And first we started with a street crossing setup where we used uh, a treadmill and this was a self-paced treadmill, so a passive treadmill, not a motorized treadmill. And participants were standing on the set, a treadmill. We had, uh, uh, we had three screens in front of them, similar to the tr um, car driving setup. <laughs> and participants were asked to watch for gaps between cars while walking on the treadmill. From while to while, they, they were asked to, to yeah, they, they stood in fr at the street, they watched the traffic coming from right to left, and they were asked to watch for gaps between cars, and when there was a gap, they were asked to cross the street by, while walking on this treadmill. And they did it just, um, just as a single task or as a multitask or dual task. And in the dual task condition, they were asked to type a three digit number similar to the driving scenario. We had here in this study young and old adults. And uh, what I show here um, to you are the behavioral data of this, this street crossing paradigm. So again, we looked at different parameters. We, we, for example, looked at the stay time, so how long they stood at the street before they crossed it. And we also looked at the gap, so which gap they chose to cross the street, uh, the, to cross the street and gaps increased in time. The longer they stood, the, the longer the gap were. And what we see here, um, is the performance for two um, selected outcome measures and we see the single task performance, we see the multitask performance visual and we see the multitask performance auditorily meaning multitask visual means they, uh, they heard which three digit number they were asked to type and for the so that's auditory, for the visual, it was um, presented on the screen. So that's the only difference. So the stimulus presentation differed and you see that it seems to make a difference here. So it depends on whether you present this um, numbers auditorily or visually. And it also, again, depends on what measure you look at. What we can say when we look at all our data here, we see effects on stay time, we see effects of gap, we see effects of safety distance and speed, not shown here. And we also see an interaction effect for task and groups. So group are the young and old ones here. And what we uh, see or what we can conclude here, we see partly differences between the age groups, but the old ones are not always such bad as we expected them to be. We have a lot of stereotypes in our minds. And <laughs> multitasking cost uh, also differs with regard to the type of task and the presentation modality. Again, it makes a difference whether you present an, um, a stimuli auditory or visually the one or the other might distract you more or less. So on the left hand side, you see if uh, the stay type was much higher for the old ones and for the young ones if you present it visually, but not if you presented it auditorily. So this was our first street crossing study where we used this uh, kind of street crossing simulator setup. And then now during the last years, we continue to use a more advanced setup that's the GRAIL GATE Real-Time Analysis Interactive Lab, the GRAIL. The GRAIL system is a customized system. You buy the system at, at, at once, so it's, it's how it is. It looks like this, so you have a screen in front of you that's a 240 degree or 180 degree screen, and you have a treadmill, it's a motorized treadmill, it can also be a self-paced self treadmill, um, and this treadmill is a split belt treadmill, so you can um, um, change the, the speed of the right and the left foot. Um, you, it's, it's moving in all directions, back and forth and to the side and can swing, so it can do a lot. 
And um, so we used the setup and again uh, tried to combine it with FNIRS and it seems to work. So I will show you some results in a couple of minutes, but before I know, introduce our study and our results, I'll give the floor to Robert because Robert prepares a video on our GRAY system, on our current setup, to give you more hands-on experience on that. So let's see how it works. So that are some pictures of our lab right now. So we installed it in Münster in January this year. And I have been to Chemnitz University from 2015 to 2019. And there we also had this GRAIL set up. And there we collected our first data with the GRAIL. And now we are happy to have the same system in Münster as well. It looks like this. So here you have a, a good impression, hopefully, of the uh, treadmill, how it looks like, and the, the screen, and then you have the computer, and you have a server room to, to uh, connect everything together. It's working together with a, a projector system and a Vicom system to, uh, for movement analyzers. You can also implement EMG if you want to get even more data. We didn't do it so far, but it's possible. And yeah, so that's how it looks uh, in a static mode. And let's now see how it looks when Robert introduces it to you. Um, hello and welcome everyone to our session on motor cognitive performance in complex virtual scenarios on behavioral data and neural correlates. Um, in our current session, I would like to introduce uh, the measurement of mobile brain imaging in a complex virtual environment that you can see here. In this case, or this time, it's a walking environment, where last time we have presented some uh, introduction on the driving simulator and how to assess brain function during complex dual tasks uh, during driving in older adults. And in this scenario here, we are, um, having, we are also testing um, currently older adults, uh, where they perform a walking task, where they also uh, do additional cognitive or have additional cognitive loads uh, during walking. And this is our overall setup, the so-called Grail system. Uh, where we investigate the, the walking performance in all the adults by using uh, the, the force plates that are integrated in the treadmill that you can see on the left side. And it's a split belt treadmill with two individual force plates that can measure gait performance of the older adults while they perform different tasks or just walk through a, through a virtual environment that creates a more realistic flow of motion um, compared, to, compared to when just walking on a treadmill against, while looking at the wall, for example. And this complex environment creates, uh, creates additional visual input which distracts all the adults or just creates a more naturalistic uh, perception of motion and flow of motion or visual flow uh, during walking. And in our current project, we are investigating the effects of different uh, dual tasks on walking performance while also addressing the brain activation during walking performance in, con in comparison to uh, walking while doing an additional cognitive task. And here we use an inhibition task, a stroop task, that might be very familiar to you already, but you will see it in a second as well. And we are also using a, a serial threes task, where the subjects have to count backwards by means of three, uh, from a given number that will be presented on the screen. And our subjects are performing six different tasks in that virtual reality, which are a standing task that we just use for baseline comparisons of the baseline FNIR signal compared to uh, or compared to the, the task-related activation of the FNIRS, I will refer to that in a, in a second. And there's a walking task which is performed at one meter per second, continuously over a duration of 30 seconds. And then there's two different, uh, the, the two different cognitive tasks that are either performed during uh, standing or during walking. All of that is presented in German, uh, but you will notice uh, which task is uh, currently present uh, just from the visuals on the screen. And meanwhile, we are also um, assessing brain function, as I said. We are currently addressing the prefrontal cortex and the parietal cortex in order to have the interaction between the two brain regions uh, with regard to age. Because um, during aging, uh, the brain underwent uh, complex um, adaptations due to the effects of aging on the neurophysiology. And therefore, we are currently capturing these two areas in order to assess the interaction during dual tasking and compensation related or deep differentiation or inefficiency related um, uh, mechanisms in the aging brain. And what you can see, maybe we can uh, go a bit on, on the FNU system with the camera uh, so that the, the audience can see the, the setup. We just didn't cover uh, the FNU setup. So normally we have a, uh, we have a shower cap as well. 
uh, somewhere here, uh, which we will which we will put over the FNIR setup in order to shield the uh, the photon um, em emissions uh, emitters and detectors from the um, ambient light or from the canvas light that it, uh, is otherwise distorting the signal. We already have performed calibration. We are currently assessing data, as you may have noticed on the laptop here already. Uh, but we just leave it uh, uncovered so that you have a better intention of how to address the uh, brain function correlates. Uh, one of my research assistants, uh, Thea, has already prepared the FNIS um, setup on Luisa there. And as you can see, we were very carefully in putting all the cables on the, on the subject and uh, to make sure that uh, the, the small boxes that you can see at the back of Luisa are not pulling on the optodes, uh, which otherwise would induce strong motion artifacts during walking. So compared to driving, for example, when the subjects just sit in their, um, in their uh, seat, uh, there's no additional movement that may uh, pull on the optodes uh, at the back of the head. But when we now walk and the boxes will basically move together with the walking um, frequency, then the, uh, the boxes would pull on the optodes, inducing um, a, shift or to, um, uh, a shift of the position of the emitters, which then induces the same motion artifact when the uh, light is sent in a different angle into the cortex. I won't refer too much um, about on the, on the basics of the FNIS system, but I um, would now like to show our scenario, our current scenario um, with Luisa. We will uh, turn off the light. Of course, this is one of the most important steps uh, to measure a clear FNIS signal. And then you can see Luisa performing our current scenario on uh, different walking tasks, or on, on walking and different dual tasks. Uh, there, if you could turn off the light and start the scenario, would be great. Thank you very much. And here you can see already a very clean FNIR signal. And now Luisa starts walking. <coughs> and this is the first task where she has to, to walk and also perform a strip task for which we use a key switch, which you may see in her right hand. And she's responding to the font of the uh, color word that is presented on the screen and not to the meaning of the color word, which is, which is a typical inhibition task. And now you usually would expect an activation compared to just walking in the prefrontal cortex, of course, because it's responsible for executive functions are mainly pre-processed in the prefrontal cortex, uh, but there will also, of course, be an increase in the parietal cortex. This is our second task, where the user now is now walking and counting backwards. So there's a three-digit number presented on the screen, and she, uh, her task is to continuously count backwards by uh, means of three. again for uh, about 30 seconds. And this is our contrast conditions. So as I said, we have six different tasks and this is now the stroop task only while standing to have the same um, the same con physiological confounds uh, that, also, uh, that are also present in walking. We do these tasks as well during standing. And then we contrast the brain activation region-wise um, between the dual task situations and the single task situations. We also, of course, perform the uh, counting backwards task, or the zero freeze task, sorry, um, as a single task, and compare that, of course, as well to the walking condition in order to see which brain area is really active during which task. And this is now our baseline condition, which we primarily uh, use for validation and plausibility uh, check of the data in order to see really whether there is some task-related increase. As you may have noticed, we, um, we are currently not putting a baseline condition before each individual trial, which is normally done in FNES research, but we wanted to double the amount of trials uh, for the single tasks and the dual task conditions on the cognitive and walking task which is why we only have randomly put some baseline trials within the uh, full order of trials uh, over the, uh, across the whole scenario. Uh, therefore, we were able to double the amount of trials within the 16 minutes uh, duration of our full experiment. And otherwise, we would have resulted only in two or three trials per condition, which is a bit less, of course. But now we have five trials per condition within the 16 minutes. And after that duration of 16 minutes, uh, some subjects may experience a bit of uncomfortableness um, uh, due to the uh, wearing of the FNIFT cap, which is why we decided to limit the duration to about 16 minutes. So including calibration, it's, a, it's roughly 20 to 25 minutes. Yeah, and as you can see, there's only one channel with an uh, insufficient signal um, that uh, might be miscalibrated or because of uh, the user's haircut. 
uh, there's some issues with one of the one of the optodes which we didn't um, manage to to clean uh, to to clarify yet. But normally we would make sure that also this channel has a good signal uh, by sitting uh, really on the on the top of the head, and um, we would make sure that the hair is pulled off uh, the opto. Okay, that's our task. And I guess now Claudia will refer to the results of our blue task, so she will show uh, how or which brain area is active during which task, and she will also show our results that are currently in revision um, and soon to be published um, in a cross-sectional comparison. And in the long term, we are currently also performing a training study where we investigate uh, the effects of different types of training, which uh, Claudia probably will also refer to. Uh, but we have no results yet on, on, on that, but uh, they will be published soon as well. Um, we are investigating there whether we can reverse the pattern, for example, um, older adults show versus younger adults um, in their brain activation during dual task performance, such that they get a younger brain again as well through the uh, through different methods of training. And I wish you all the best for your uh, workshop and for the uh, in, in Slovenia, and have a good time. Bye bye. Okay, that was Robert and. Uh I think, so this is just an additional picture of our new setup because I think uh, it, it was uh, not such easy to see with all the surrounding, but um, Robert and you also took nice pictures and you see how we fix the cap and the cable that make, make, uh, so make sure that we get as less artifacts as possible. I would stop here for, for a moment uh, and open the floor for questions before I continue with uh, showing some of our results. So do you have questions? You can program it uh, both ways, so it ca it works self-paced, so that you really starts working, or it works uh, motorized. In our setup, so far we used only the motorized mo mode, so we ask participants to walk in a certain um, speed, and here we use the speed of um, one uh, meter per second. So uh, it's a Low speed, uh, manageable for also for older ones. We would say uh, you can also think of using a preferred speed. That's also done a lot in this dual tasking research. There are always pros and cons to to do the one or the other. But theoretically, is it's both possible. And as I said, it's a split belt. So meaning you can also as kind of try to simulate uh, simulate um, some um, some distractions by by the by the floor. So like. Um, uh, yeah, falling, so have, having some obstacles on the floor or something like this. You can also project the scene you have on the, uh, on the um, monitor on the treadmill that you can get the optical impression that you are really walking on, on a, in a virtual environment. So it's not done right now in this, this picture here, but typically we also project the the scene to the to the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, in the first study, you are dealing with the cognitive aging and mobility aging. So, um, but I haven't seen any perceptual measures. So in the, I guess you assume that all your participants they have the same kind of uh, contact sensitivity level that they can perceive the, the speed at the same level. Or do you have any of those measures which will which can account for some perceptual differences mm. before you start to look at their cognitive performance. Mm. So typically we use in these studies so far uh, healthy older adults, so we have strict inclusion inclusion and exclusion criteria and typically we, uh, what we do here is just screen for vision and hearing performance of the older adults and to make sure that they have um, appropriate vision and hearing performance, but we didn't use other perceptual tasks like optical flow or something like this. So when you measure the gap perception, yeah. that certainly depends on the sensitivity, capacity, and the speed perception. So I guess that kind of uh, additional measures will, will most likely explain a lot of variability. Yeah. 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 
could be, might be, but what's interesting, we don't see it in all our measures. So we don't see these age differences in the gap perception or, but, uh, or at the staying time. So uh, speed perception might uh, cause a difference, but um, so maybe older adults can even compensate for that by using their own strategies. And that's, that's I think, the other side of the, um, the coin to say. So it's, what we see in our data, it, it, that it really depends on the stimuli you use and how you measure it. And sometimes you don't see even these age-related differences. And that's also kind of good news that older adults can really compensate for their, their also perceptual declines. Other questions? Later, good. <laughs> then I continue with showing you some results. So this is, as I said, the near setup, and this is just another scenario we, we haven't used for research. So this gate uh, system is used a lot in, in therapeutic setups for different types of diseases. Uh, for example, after stroke and to recover participants after stroke. And this is a balance task where participants stood on a treadmill and were asked to, um, to somehow um, yeah, manage uh, the, to, to, um, the boat to, to go across the sea. And this is a balance task, just to give you an idea that there are many other possibilities to use it. And of course, we can also program our own setup. So for example, the Stroop task, Robert showed to you that's the task we programmed within this uh, virtual scenario, but there is still a lot room for improvement and also, um, yeah, possibilities, but it's very, very time consuming, you might imagine. So. <laughs> Vera is nodding because Vera is currently involved in this project and getting uh, helping with all this data acquisition. Yeah. So, but what we what did we do? So um, Robert already introduced it to you and said we used this uh, this uh, setup and added um, the FNIR system to the setup and we used it together with additional cognitive tasks. And for the FNIR setup, um, we had um, this this mobile setup and we looked at the frontal areas and the parietal areas. Uh, that was also a bit tricky at the, uh, at the beginning because uh, we needed to buy two FNIR setups. So these mobile <coughs> NIR setups are not made to have many optodes available. And at the beginning, uh, we had really problems to synchronize the setups. It took us about a year or even longer, but now also the company managed to, to, to make it work. So we are happy with that now and are able to use it since, since two, two, three years now, but it took a while. So, um, and then we had this cognitive task and we decided for an inhibition task that was a color, color group task and for an updating task that's a serial three task. So color group task you might be aware of, right? You have the words shown, and you have, and the words are printed in different colors. And uh, you have either to focus on the color of the word or on the meaning of the word, and have to inhibit then the color of the word. So if red printed in green, you, you might inhibit um, the color of the word and focus on the meaning of the word or the other way around. That's how the Stroop task is typically used. The serial three task is just um, substra subtracting always three from a starting number. And this is how we designed it. So we had a kind of block design here for our, our near setup. That's the reason, uh, the reason for that is because the near set uh, signal is very different from an EEG signal, so you, you mind. Uh, remember the first slide of Urosh this morning where we had uh, the EGs, EG on the very top and the FNIRs on the very bottom of this uh, list of different uh, measurement systems. So the, um, the temporal resolution of the EEG is very, very high and it's very, very low of the FNIRs compared to, to the EEG. Whereas the spatial resol resol resolution is um, better. So, and um, that, that different systems and that's the reason why you go either for an event related or for a block design and both is possible but here we chose a kind of block design and we had different uh, um, 
yeah, blocks of these different tasks. So we had the dual tasks, S, T, R, serial, uh, three tasks. We had the walking task, so just walking without doing anything else. We had the uh, serial three task, uh, um, the We had the standing task, we had the dual task, and we had the, no, sorry, the, th the throop task, we had the throop uh, task while dual tasking. Sorry, STR is a throop task, so I totally mixed it up. So we had the dual task throop, we had the serial three task at the S3, and we always had it as a single task and as a dual task, and in between we had just walking, so W4 walking, and or just standing as control task or a single task. So that's how we did it. And this is a more detailed um, listing of our methods, just if you are interested in how we designed it here. So we had a familiarization, first of all, so people typically don't, I, not all people are used to walk on a treadmill and that might give you really strange results. So people are, need to be really, uh, yeah, used to walking on a treadmill that takes some time, so it might take five minutes, it might take takes 10 minutes or even more. You may, you have to figure out what, whether they can really walk or not. Uh, we went for 16 minutes testing because we were interested in older adults here and we, we wanted to avoid fatigue. So you, you always have a trade-off uh, trade between how many trials you need to analyze your data and what's possible with your sample. And here we, we decided for these 60 minutes. We used uh, the six tasks. We had five trials per task with, uh, with several um, stimuli then, and um, yeah, and so on and so on. So this is again what we did. As, I, uh, as we already said, we had one meter per second walking speed, and um, we had this troop task, we had this counting task, they were different. So the, so the troop task and the counting task were different, so we had the fixed walking speed, and for the troop task, you uh, participants were yeah, forced to react whenever a stimulus occurs. So it is a kind of paced, not self-paced, so they had to react. They were asked to walk, not in, at a preferred speed, but the treadmill was running and they were asked to react, so they, that was a paced task. And for the counting task, they were able to um, decide about their speed of, of counting backwards. So that's more a self-paced task. That's also a difference when, we think, when you think of what tasks you combine with your, for example, walking tasks, be aware of that. That you can go for a paced task, that you can go for a self-paced task, and that might also influence your results. And when you scan the literature, it's not always carefully reported, and you find the, yeah, the whole variety of all different stimuli combinations. So just be aware of that. Okay, but here are some of our results when we look at the prefrontal parietal brain activation during dual task walking. And what we see here is, you see on the, now the mouse should work, yeah. So we have this, uh, this group task, single task, dual task, uh, zero three task, single, dual task, we have the walking task, and what you see here, you see a higher activation between single, uh, so a high activation while dual tasking than while single tasking in the prefrontal areas particularly. You also see it a bit in the parietal areas. And when we think of the prefrontal cortex responsible for task coordination, then uh, this might explain these differences. Um, the prefrontal cortex upregulation is not related to capacity limitations of the prefrontal cortex, uh, as we see here, a strong positive relationship. 
So then we looked at the single data. So these are the single data of the participants. Uh, so just a scatter plot. And we tried to correlate the data we found on the behavioral level with uh, the data, uh, the FNIRS data. And what we see here, we see small correlations between brain activity and dual task performance. Here we calculate the, uh, the B IS, the balanced integration score for Scrupa Series 3, and we use the step variability for walking performance. <sighs> we found um, a higher activity coming along with a lower performance in the t in, on the behavioral level. And when we think of aging and what that means in the context of aging, it seems to be that, um, that we see here neural inefficiency rather than capacity limitations. Capacity limitations would, uh, would mean the, uh, uh, the relationship the other way around. So we here see really the persons who show a higher brain activity that are the ones who um, perform worse. And the most distinct correlations we see in the VLPFC, so in the frontal cortex areas. And again, as I said um, before, uh, frontal, prefrontal cortex is related to task coordination. They seem to really have difficulties with task, sorry, with task coordination. We also looked at regional differences in brain activation between single and dual tasks here. You see in red uh, dual task stroop. You see in orange single task stroop. You see in light blue single task uh, uh, serial three and in dark blue dual task serial three. And what you see here is uh, we have region-specific activation differences between single and dual tasking. And uh, we see that uh, the frontal areas, here we looked at the, uh, uh, particularly the uh, VLPFC, uh, show higher activation differences between single and dual tasking performance. So that we would conclude that this task coordination seems to be mainly located in this areas here. Sorry, in this areas here. Stop. Okay, that were some results of our cross-sectional analysis where we just compared single and dual task performance between young and uh, not between young and old ones, only in the in a sample of young adults and looked at brain activation while single tasking and while dual tasking in a kind of ecological valid scenario. And then um, in the next step, uh, we aim to conduct an intervention study to improve dual task performance by uh, um, yeah, a certain type of intervention. And that's what I am also going to present to you. But first of all, some, some background information. So why did I say inefficient processing? Why did I say compensation? So you are more or less maybe familiarly with, familiar with aging research. That's the reason why I brought you one slide to introduce these age-related functional changes that are discussed a lot in the literature during the last, let's say, 20 years now. And we see different changes related to aging in the brain. So on the behavioral level, older adults might perform the same as young ones, but the brain might work differently. So you see sometimes no differences between young and old ones on the behavioral level, but you see dif differences in the brain and also the other way around. So, and what's discussed are different changes in activation patterns. So one phenomenon that's observed is that older adults perform tasks mostly less lateralized, called de-differentiation. So for young adults, you typically see a very distinct activation in one side of the brain, whereas for the same task, uh, on the behavioral level, maybe the same performance either, uh, even, you see a more lateralized activation. 
you see sometimes more diffuse activation comes, uh, comes along with less lateralized activation. You see sometimes higher activation of older adults than of young adults when performing the same task. And this is um, interpreted as compensation. So older adults compensate for the age-related changes by using more of their re brain resources, by upregulating their brain so they have higher activation. When higher activation comes along with less performance, then it's interpreted as inefficient activity. And we also observe a kind of posterior anterior shift, meaning that sometimes frontal regions are used to compensate for parietal or general changes in the brain. So there are different phenomena described in the aging literature. Uh, what, what's uh, typical for older adults, it always depends on your data how to interpret it. So you need to have, you need to look at the behavioral data, you need to look at the brain data to make sense of it and try to interpret whether you see a higher activation, where you see a um, inefficient activation, where you see this lateralization. It's not consistent about all studies and all findings we have. But this is the general idea with aging and what happens in the brain while you age. And the other thing is, and that relates to what we heard this morning already, that there are ways to improve physical, uh, to improve our brain also in older adults. And one um, type of activity that seems to help to maintain brain health or even improve the functioning of our brain could be physical activity, could be just cognitive activity could be maybe a combination of both. And there's a lot of research going on right now uh, to figure, or not right now, again, since 20 years or even 50 years, I would say. So the first studies that have been conducted on that have been conducted in the 1990s. So, um, so pretty, yeah, long time ago, and, uh, or even earlier. So, but, uh, um, so I would say since 20 years now, this is uh, also done in combination with brain imaging methods. And now during the last couple of years, it's more and more in the focus to see whether physical activity or cognitive activity or a combination of both is more affecting in improving the brain of older adults than the one or the only type of activity. And that's the reason why we conducted also an, an intervention study. Um, and here we conducted an intervention study not only focusing on cognitive training, but also focusing on physical training and try to combine it somehow. And you see this, this uh, figure here by Reuter Lorenz and Lustig is also a very old one, but I like it because it, it very easily summarizes negative and positive effects on the aging system. And you see here cognitive training or training in general and also cardiovascular training might help to improve the functioning of your brain. So, and that's what we try to do with our um, dual tasking um, setup and with our dual tasking idea. So our, uh, our aim in this study here, in this intervention study was, and still is, to combine physical and cognitive training to improve dual task performance. And that's very important, I think, to think about your outcome measure. So we did another intervention studies years ago where we focus on cognitive performance. There are other studies focusing on, for example, motor performance. And here we focus on dual task performance. And depending on your outcome measure, the design of the, the, your study might differ. And in this study, we, we, our idea was, when you think of dual tasking, walking while talking, for example, then it might be the case that we have good walkers in our study, people who are already able to walk, but they might have some cognitive problems. We might also have uh, participants in our study with really worse cognitive performance. No, that's what I had, right? So a good walker with worse cognitive performance. We also might have bad walkers in our study with good cognitive performance. 
We might also have the good ones, meaning good walker and good, good cognitive performance. We might have the bad ones, so bad walker and bad cognitive performance. So we might have all types of participants in our study. We typically have a huge variability, particularly when we think of older adults. And that's the reason why we thought, so we might be careful with our data and we also might be careful with our design. And for the ones who have problems to walk, we should focus more on a cognitive intervention, uh, on a motor intervention. And for the ones who have problems to think, we should focus more on the cognitive intervention. So it might differ what's, what's best for, for a certain participant. And that's the reason why we aim to design a kind of individualized and adaptive training program in very small groups. And due to Corona, the groups were even smaller during the last couple of months. Um, and we designed a program for 12 weeks, two times per week for, for 60 minutes each. And here we decided for the three different types of exercise. We had one group that conducted just a physical training program. And that was mainly gait and posture training, uh, coordination, balance, flexibility, and strength. We had a third group that, uh, that received a cognitive training where we trained a broad set of uh, cognitive functions. So particularly executive functions, so inhibition, updating, and switching. And we had a combined group, and uh, we call this our multitasking group. And this combined group did exactly the same as the physical and the cognitive group. So the, uh, the physical tasks here were exactly the same we used for the multitasking group, and the cognitive tasks were exactly the same again we used for the multitasking. It was a bit tricky to design this, this physical task the way that we can do it also together with a cognitive task because we have some restrictions when you, you are asked to do a cognitive task while balancing or while walking. We use these screens and we use a uh, um, kind of trackball track ball mouse to, to, um, as a controller for this, this cognitive task. And, uh, but our idea was to, to make it as similar as possible to see really whether the one or the only training uh, brings the better results or whether the results differ with respect to the individual preconditions of the participants. That was our idea and that's what we did so far. So we uh, collected some of the data of about 60 participants two years ago in Chemnitz, so my former place. And then I moved to Münster and the whole lab had to be uh, set up again and then Corona came. <laughs> and now we are here. So this week we have the last participant in our lab and we finished uh, the second phase of data collection. Now we have about 70 something participants also collected in Münster. We are very happy that now we have our whole sample together. So we aim for about 150 participants. We, we did a power calculation before and that's what we were ending with. And what I can show to you right now is just the first preliminary analysis of the 60 participants. And yeah, hopefully next time I'll present to you the whole sample. Yeah, so, but that's what we did and um, that's where we are right now. Okay, so, but what did we do exactly? So we use a pre-post-test battery. Some seems well, is probably familiar to you because we had it in other studies as well and you heard about this today. So let's go. Bears is there. So we used a cognitive uh, battery. We looked at executive functions. We used an NBAC task for working memory, a switching task. We used a Simon task for inhibition. And we also used a dual tasking task that were just standardized cognitive tests here. We used, we used a physical fitness battery. We used a VO2, VO2 max measure or VO2 peak measure, a spiro agrometry to assess VO2 performance. We use a pegboard test for fine coordination. We use a feet tapping test for speed, a balance test, um, and uh, a chair stand test. And of course, the participants uh, were in our um, driving simulator and in the gray system, and we measured it pre-post. That's what we do. 
or did. And here are some of our results for um, the cognitive test. As I said, from the participants who were available when we did this anal analysis, and you see here, uh, updating shifting inhibition, and you see differences between the groups at least a bit. And to summarize it, um, the cognitive training group seems to show the highest improvement for all this task. So you might guess now what the cognitive group is. <laughs> because uh, our, our analyzer was blinded to the groups. That's the reason why I just got numbers for that. And uh, the training effects nevertheless seem to vary, vary between the executive functions and, oops, sorry. Uh, and the effect seems to be most distinct for inhibition. So the green group was our cognitive training group and that showed the most effects for this inhibition task. And um, yeah, let's see what happens as well. So and then we looked at the physical fitness here and the training effects on, on tapping pegboard, um, posture and cardiovascular fitness. And we see here different effects. Um, and um, we found here the most consistent improvements in the physical training group. So the physical training group improved uh, uh, most in all these physical tests. So that might be uh, not surprising, but we didn't find it so far in this uh, cognitive test and in this uh, physical test any benefit of our dual tasking group. And then we looked at our uh, dual tasking performance while walking, so um, on, in the grade system. And you see the number of participants is not such high per group, uh, but nevertheless, that, that were the participants we were able to analyze to, give, to get an idea how, how it uh, looks like. And what we can see here, so that's what we did pre-post in the grail. What we see here when we look at our data here, we have the physical training group on the left hand side, the cognitive training group in the middle and the multitasking group on the right hand side. We see the pre and post activation uh, in, uh, while using the nears while walking. And we see here the pre-post differences, particularly again for the cognitive training group. Visually, we also see it for the multitasking group, but not uh, significant so far. And uh, just to summarize it, <laughs> just to summarize it, so my time is, is, is up, so that's the reason probably, I don't know. So both programs involved in cognitive domains, so the cognitive training and the multitasking training seem to reduce brain activity during dual tasking. Uh, we found no effect for the physical training on brain function during dual tasking. Um, the effect seems to differ, nevertheless, between task and training groups. We see probably region-specific effects. Um, we uh, question ourselves right now, do we see increases in efficiency after training? Might be the case why we see the uh, changes in this brain activation here and how we can interpret it. And sorry again, so that's what we see right now. And the next step for us to, would be to pull all the data we collected and then we are also able to look at these individual differences and to see whether participants profit differently from the different training programs depending on their baseline level. So that would be our next step. But this gives you maybe an overview of what we did with our Grail and NIRS data so far and what's coming next. And uh, because the title of the summer school has to do something with Parkinson disease, I thought the next slide should tell you, yes, we are also going to do this same setup with Parkinson disease patients. In the, we are in the midst of preparation for that right now. And here with a certain group of party, Parkinson disease patients. And at the moment, we are in the midst of set, uh, yeah, preparing the setup. So and that's it from my side. And I thank you for your your attention, just a short summary, but I think you can read it by yourself because you want to go for, for lunch maybe now. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Claudia. Can we have it here? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Claudia, so much. Uh, I think we have room. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe just one physiological question. So, um, if you're looking at the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, um, there, there seems to be a close neighbor to um, the frontal eye fields, right? So, like any option, specifically in the scoop test, that you have, you have systematic eye movements because you have to jump down to the side. So, it's like a vertical and horizontal eye movements. Can you disentangle the bold signal um, from both areas? Um, we can disentangle. So we so so if if you have uh, so if you look at our setup, we don't we didn't use the uh, the optodes in the uh, so very down here. So we use the the uh, we because we had really problems at the uh, at the beginning that people uh, so it was very harmful for participants to to wear this cap. So the, that the reason why I think it's it's maybe not so much influenced by that. Uh, we can um, we can we we correct our data. Um, I'm not sure whether and how, but we uh, I, therefore I need to, to talk to Robert whether and how we corrected for this eye, eye movement. So we did the typical corrections, and when you look at the FNIRS data and analyze so far, typically FNIRS is mainly used for the prefrontal cortex with one or, or two L, uh, optodes and uh, I think here now we, we use this, uh, uh, a setup where we had at least uh, eight optodes so that, that's better than nothing and even more than most of, of the other studies did so I think uh, it should be okay but might be might be a problem still other next question Just so the refers to um, the self phase or the external mm -hmm. phase. So you you have like uh, you refer the pacing to the primary tasks, right, but not the secondary tasks. And you basically create like two setups that are not directly comparable because you can switch between primary and secondary task load by simply walking slower at the cognitive task and gets more demand. So how do you handle these differences in the two effects? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so the walking itself cannot be changed. So that's paced, and uh, in, yeah? both, hmm? yeah. in both tasks, the walking is fixed. It's one meter per second, okay, okay. and uh, in the throop task, the stimuli occur in a certain. Um, so they occur on the screen in a certain um, yeah, speed. So you cannot change this as well. So it's a very um, yeah fixed mode, and participants have to react or not. But um, and for the zero reaction time task, they uh, were asked to calculate, but they can do it in their own pacing. And that's, I would say, the difference between ta the task. And I didn't show the analyzers to you, but when we compare performance in, this, in the Stroop and in the um, zero three task, we really see differences. But in the, on the, in the behavioral performance, that can be related to this, the pacing of the task, I would say. So that would explain that we sometimes find differences. And some study found this result and the other this, because we have this pacing also to yeah, take into consideration that. Thank you very much yeah? for your talk. Thank you. That so were only two. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but uh, any case, in any case, Cloud, thank you so much for, for the speech. I think we should continue this discussion. And if you had like any questions that you think that they are too basic and you couldn't understand it, it's just like the right timing after the lunch time to so, you know question that. Okay, it's now no stupid question, so that's always the case. Yeah, and uh, and just to add on that, so this is just uh, the multitasking team, and there are of course many other participants and uh, and people in the lab, and also Vera is now involved in the study, and not in this, not mentioned here that that's by mistake. So sorry for that, Vera. And uh, so yeah. let's do some multitasking. Passing now, going outside, grabbing a plate, and then you know talking at the same time. Okay. <laughs> okay, enjoy the, the lunch break and thank you.